Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents Real Science Now, featuring top experts in science and medicine, covering everything from new planets to curing cancer to virtual reality and many topics in between. The Real Science Now lectures are hosted by the Great Lakes Science Centre and presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University, its College of Arts and Sciences and Media Vision. Thank you for joining us. My name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins. Today's program features three presentations entitled Exoplanets, What 3,000 New Planets Are Telling Us About Our Own, Sustainability, Breakthroughs in Green Energy Storage, and Microbial Resistance. Can we have pork chops and antibiotics too? Let's begin with Dr. David Spurgel talking about the discovery of thousands of planets around stars other than our sun. So I want to talk today about um, exoplanets, and this has been a remarkable area of discovery in the past 20 years. When I was a student, I learned about the nine planets that have made up, make up our solar system. In the subsequent years, we learned that there are many other objects out there like Pluto, that Pluto is but one of hundreds of Kuiper Belt objects. And rather than make elementary students learn a hundred planet names, we realized that a more sensible classification was to say that Pluto was not a planet. Um, this, I think, is, just in terms of education, a wonderful teachable moment that we sometimes miss. I think we too often talk about science as something that is a set of knowledge that we know. But what science, for me, is a process of discovery. And we continue to learn more about our universe. We now understand that it's better, to, more sensible to speak of only eight planets for our own solar system. And but while we've taken away one planet, we've added at least 3,000 more. And this has been a remarkable period of discovery. I'm going to talk mostly about planets discovered by a method called the transit method. The idea here is we look at a nearby star. We wait for a planet to pass in front of the star. The planet blocks the light from the star. The star gets a little bit dimmer. And as this light curve shows when the planet's in front of the star. The star's a little dimmer. You watch it dim. You watch it get brighter again. By measuring how much light is blocked, you can measure the size of the planet. Imagine that you had a planet as big as the star. It would completely block the light. It would be totally dark. So by knowing the star's size, measuring the brightness, we can infer the planet's size. The second thing we want to do is figure out a way in which we can measure the planets, how far the planet is from the star. That we can do as well by looking how often that blocking occurs. That planet's on an orbit around the star. If the planet's period is one year, then once a year, the things line up right, and we see this dimming. So we can measure by looking at this effect the planet's size and its distance from its host star. And those are going to be, in our initial discussions, the two useful things we'll know about these planets that we've discovered. While it sounds straightforward, this requires making incredibly precise measurements. So this Kepler instrument was designed to measure variations in the brightness of a star of one part in a million. And this was a project where, when it was first proposed, everyone said, you can't make that precise a measurement. And the team that proposed this went to NASA. First competition failed, came back four years later. The second competition failed, came back four years later. And the third competition failed. The fourth competition, they succeeded and have gone on to discover thousands of planets. And this shows the space that they filled in. And remember, the two things we're going to measure is the orbital period, how often we see the events, and the relative size relative to Earth. And you can see Earth-sized planets 
Neptune-sized planets and Pluto-sized planets, and we have found thousands of these planets. This surprised us in multiple ways. While the first and perhaps the biggest surprise, and I would say this should be the takeaway perhaps for all of you from this talk, is that planets are as common as stars. We basically find comparable numbers of planets and stars. Some stars have no planets, some stars have several planets, but our galaxy is filled with billions of stars and it is also filled with billions of planets. And the planets seem to come in a wide range of sizes and shapes. In our own solar system, and what we do as scientists is we take the case we know and we extrapolate from it. You notice in our own solar system, the inner planets are all rocky planets like Earth, Mars, Venus, Mercury, Mars. The gaseous planets are far out. Lots of these systems have gaseous planets like Jupiter with orbital periods much shorter than the Earth. So there's lots of gas giants far in. What's even stranger, in our own solar system, we see a big gap between Earth and Uranus. Uranus's radius is four times bigger than Earth. And being good theorists, we had good theories that explained why there should be a gap, why you should only form things either Earth size or if they pe got past a critical size, they'll create lots of gas and get bigger. And we expected when the data came in to be a big gap between Earth and Neptune. Anyone see a gap in that data? No. So there's a whole class of objects that we call super Earths or mini Neptunes that seem to be incredibly common um, that we're finding lots of. And this shows the distribution of objects that have been found. And there are just a lot of these super Earth size objects. And this distribution, I should note, is what we actually see. It's easier to see big things than small things. So that, you know, in fact, what we infer from this is a distribution we correct for the ability to see, you know, you find all the big things, you miss some of the small things. The distribution we think keeps rising. And there are more Earth sized planets out there than Jupiter sized planets. Now, this, we find not only the count, but we find lots of fascinating systems. And I'll just give you a couple examples. This is a system called Kepler 62. It contains five planets, big, much bigger than Earth, within the orbit of Venus. You can see it's an incredibly compact system. And it shows that planet formation can sometimes be incredibly efficient. The system is so compact that if you tried adding an extra planet, it would get ejected from the system. And based on what we've seen from the systems we've discovered, we actually think planet formation is quite efficient and that when solar systems form, they've probably ejected many planets. And we suspect that interstellar space is filled with free-floating planets that are orphan planets wandering without stars. We found some amazing systems. Um, some of you may remember Tatooine from Star Wars, right? That system that had the, you know, the desert planet with two suns. Nature, as it often does, does us better. And this is a recently uh, imaged system where there's a planet shown as B here, orbiting star A. And this is to scale. And then there's a pair of stars, B and C, orbiting A. So if you lived on that planet, either part of the day you'd have star A in your sky, and part of the day you'd have star B and C in the sky. You'd live in a planet, at least at this position in its orbit, that didn't have darkness. And uh, you know, here's the actual data where astronomers have designed a coronagraph, and we'll come back to coronagraphs at the end, where they could image the planet, blocks the light from star A and see star B, and image the whole system here. So what have we learned so far? Planets are common. There's about one Earth-like planet for every five stars. Multiple planets are common. And we're finding all kinds of complex, rich systems out there. 
and I could devote, and if we, this was a conference on extrasolar planets, we would spend uh, hours talking about individual fascinating systems that we found that are informing our understanding of these systems. But once you've found that there are planets there, one of the questions we want to ask is, are the planets habitable? You know, do they look like this, and when can we put in the Starbucks? And um, when we think about this question, keep in mind that most of what we know about these systems is just how big they are, just their radius. And we can look at our own solar system to inform us about this and ask, is the planet like Venus or like Earth? At first glance, at the level of data we have now for most extrasolar systems, Venus and Earth are identical. They're twins. Venus is about the same size as the Earth. It's about 95% of its radius, about the same mass, about the same density. Because its cloud layer is so white, when we observe its surface temperature, its temperature at the top of the cloud layer is actually a little bit colder than Earth. So at first glance, it appears that Venus should be Earth's twin. The difference is our atmospheres. Venus has an enormous amount of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere, you can see, is mostly CO2 with trace amounts of nitrogen. The pressure in the Earth's atmosphere right here is one bar. That's how much air we have above us. If we were on the surface of Venus, it's 93 bars. Venus's atmosphere has 90 times the mass of the Earth's atmosphere, made up primarily of carbon dioxide. All of the carbon that in the Earth is incorporated in its, our core, our, our crust, in the case of Venus, is in its atmosphere. And CO2 is a greenhouse gas. And we get to see this very clearly in Venus. Venus's surface temperature is about 600 degrees. So all that global, this is global warming gone wild. And if we were to live on Venus's surface, it would look more like this than that nice beachfront with the uh, Starbucks. And one of the questions we want to ask about these extrasolar planets is, are they like Earth? Are they like Venus? Or actually, what I think is most likely, they have a, a different history from either planet. And the way we're going to do that and address these kinds of questions is study the properties of the planet's atmosphere by getting its a spectra. So this shows what we hope to measure in these systems, how much light we see as a function of wavelength. And this is plotted going from ultraviolet light through visible light through infrared light. When we observe with our eyes or with our telescopes, light comes at different wavelengths. The difference between red light and blue light is blue light is a shorter wavelength, red longer, radio waves are even longer. We can measure, and this will be a spectrum of the Earth, what we see as the reflectance of the Earth's surface as a function of wavelength. And in the case of the Earth, you'll notice at the short wavelength end, short words of about 0.6 microns, it goes up. That's because the sky is blue. You're seeing the blue sky in that data there. That actually gives you a measure of the Earth's pressure. What we could also then do is look for these individual lines. And uh, a little bit of atomic physics, each atom, each molecule has its own special fingerprint in terms of the spectral lines associated with it. So if I see lines at those particular wavelengths, I know there's oxygen in the atmosphere. So what we'd like to do is see the presence of oxygen, water, carbon dioxide. That would tell us we're looking at a planet that has Earth-like properties. Early Earth was quite different. Early Earth, before we had plants producing copious amounts of oxygen, had an atmosphere that was dominated by methane. So if we were to see a planet like this, it would actually be Earth-like, perhaps, but before lots of oxygen was produced. How are we going to do this? We'll do this through two techniques. And this will actually tie into two of the missions that Glenn mentioned as doing important work in cosmology. We'll also make important contributions here. What we're going to want to do 
with the first set of, of missions is make use of these extrasolar planetary transits, making use of when the planet passes in front of the star. We're going to want to do this around the nearest stars, because we want things that are really bright targets. Next year, NASA is going to launch a mission called TESS. And what TESS will do is it's an another transiting mission, but it is optimized to study the brightest nearby stars. And we'll stare at them and find the transiting planets around those stars. Once it does that, we'll take the James Webb Space Telescope, which is scheduled to launch in 2018. And James Webb was designed to do important things in cosmology, but because of its tremendous sensitivity in the infrared, it's also a very powerful telescope for studying extrasolar planets. It's an enormous telescope. It's collecting areas six times that of Hubble. It is the most complex space mission we've ever built. And uh, one of the many things that keeps me up at night as an astronomer is worrying how well this deploys. Because this is, you know, this will be for us a month of terror as this enormous thing unfolds in space. And if this works as well as we hope, it will be a great engineering accomplishment first, but most of all a powerful instrument for studying cosmology and for doing transit spectroscopy. So when the planet passes in front of a star, not only do you block it by the rocky planet, but also the atmosphere around it. And uh, we'll hope to study it that way. We'll also hope to do direct imaging. And I'm running late, so I'll say a little bit quickly about direct imaging. Um, we're going to use this WFIRST telescope, and we will put a, um, a coronagraph on it. A coronagraph is a special solution we have to block the light from the star. And when you're looking at a planet around a star, the planet, the star is a billion times brighter than the planet. How do you see something dim next to something bright? There's broadly two approaches. One, if I want to stare at something right next to that light, I'll hold up my hand and block it. So one approach, and this is something that uh, Glenn Starfman and his team here in Cleveland have worked on and we've continued, is you develop a star shade and you block it that way. Another is you develop an internal star shade and you block the light within the telescope, and that lets you look at the planet. And what we aim to achieve with this upcoming mission is improve our contrast ratio. You can see what we're capable of doing with Hubble is contrast ratios of about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. We're going to push down to the 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10 range. And with that improvement, we will be able to directly image these super Earths and Neptunes. And if everything goes well, we will be able to image Earth-like planets. With that, if we can start to characterize their atmospheres, we could start to make progress on answering which, what for me is one of the deepest questions here. And I think the question that will be driving much of 21st century astronomy. And this is this question, are we alone? We've made a lot of progress on this. We now know there are billions of planets in our galaxy. There are Earth-sized planets and Earth-mass planets are common. We're soon going to be able to, detect, to study the atmospheres of planets in more detail. We may soon be able to detect signs of life, if we can detect oxygen. And perhaps we'll be able to ask questions for the evolutionary biologists like, what would life like be like on other Earths? And uh, I'll end with a quick advertisement. Um, I actually have uh, 24 lectures on imagining other Earths available free on Coursera for those of you who would like to uh, delve more deeply into this. Um, and then end uh, for my evolutionary biology friends with a speculation that if life evolves elsewhere and the atmosphere is transparent, the ability to see your prey or your predators in the distance is probably going to be valuable enough that eyes will evolve not just on this planet in multiple ways, 
but throughout the universe in multiple ways. So on that speculation, I'll end. Thanks. You've been watching David Spurgle discussing the exploding knowledge about planets orbiting other stars. Up next is Dr. Bob Savinel discussing the storage of large amounts of energy for the electrical grid. Now, back to the talk. I'm an engineer and I've been involved in uh, electrochemistry and energy, energy storage for quite a few years. And I'm going to talk about, I'm going to get to introducing to you a new uh, uh, technology of energy storage that we're working on a case and basically give you an idea uh, where we're going with it. But to do that, I wanted to first talk about why uh, there's this great interest in energy storage these days. First of all, why, does, why will energy storage help us? And I'm talking about large-scale energy storage. So I'm not talking about the energy storage in your cell phones and your laptop computers. I'm not talking about the energy storage you're going to have in your uh, automobiles. I'm talking about very large-scale energy storage that's going to be used for utilities. Okay, so there's, I, I basically have uh, uh, really three different reasons up here. I don't know why the extra bullet got in there. But uh, improve the efficiency and robustness of the grid is a primary driving force for this. Uh, relief uh, congestion and uh, transmission, uh, transmitting power and electricity to various locations uh, is being very much congested these days. And it enable penetration of intermittent renewable energy. So I'm going to talk about two of these uh, primarily, uh, the first one and the third one. But we're talking about energy storage in terms of sizes of kilowatts to megawatts in terms of power. And we're talking about seconds uh, of uh, energy being delivered to uh, uh, an application, uh, for example, to sort of uh, normalize some of the fluctuations that you get in the load from day-to-day -day operation, all the way to perhaps hours and multiple hours of energy storage for long-term lapses of energy. Okay, and uh, in the uh, right there, I have this little plot here of a uh, basically show a, a diagram of um, energy stores in the context of uh, the power it could deliver versus how many hours of energy that can actually be delivered. Um, and you can see that uh, technologies like hydro um, storage and uh, compressed air gas in the upper right hand corner there, uh, those. Uh, can store energy and deliver energy for very large amounts for very long periods of time. Whereas down in the bottom here you have supercapacitors that actually can have large power ratings but relatively short periods of time. And then there's some uh, mechanical techniques like flywheels and then we have of course the electrochemistry techniques uh, such as lithium batteries everybody's heard about and uh, lead acid battery and I'm going to be introducing a new concept in the flow batteries that we're working on. So let's first of all talk about some of the grid basics. Um, so this uh, diagram here uh, shows a, uh, uh, an energy uh, distribution in terms of the power versus hours per day and where the energy comes from. So for the base load at the bottom there, you see nuclear, coal, hydro. Those are primarily base load providers of energy. These are power plants that operate they like to operate continuously at a constant uh, delivery rate uh, because it's hard to take a coal plant and fire it up and down. And it's hard to take a nuclear plant and change its load delivery continuously. On the other hand, uh, the load is that black curve above there. That's the, the amount of electricity that we need at any given time. So the difference between that base load and the, uh, the actual demand is supplied by these uh, energy sources called peakers. These are small energy plants that can deliver energy and they can ramp up very quickly, deliver the, uh, the electricity as you need it. Most of them are fired by uh, natural gas. Of course, in Ohio here, more of the baseload plants are being replaced with natural gas, but you're still using natural gas as your peakers. And then you see that little green curve there. That's what happens if you put intermittent energy into the system, such as solar energy, and um, uh, wind energy, it sort of uh, takes up some of the demand, but you still have to provide those peakers in there to make up the differences because you don't have any control at all in the intermittency of, of these type of energy sources. Okay, so um, in the case of the intermittent wind, wind 
energy sources, okay? Uh, this uh, plot here on the left shows uh, hours a day and it shows the, uh, the energy being delivered by a couple different sources. And what we see is a green curve in the wind, the wind energy. If you're a sailor like I am, you know at the middle of the night you get quite a bit of wind. In the morning, there's quite a bit of wind. And then it sort of uh, falls off a little bit in the afternoon. And when you get into the evening hours, uh, early evening hours, it really dips just about the time we want to start a race. Right, Glenn? <laughs> and, then, and then after we get in and we start drinking beer in the patio, the wind comes up again. <laughs> That's pretty typical in the Cleveland area. And then, of course, the solar energy you can see is just, you know, uh, no solar energy at night, um, comes up in the morning, drops down, okay? So there's a lot of da daily variation. And we show a demand curve there. It's a very mild demand curve because this actual demand curve for a, a, um, a, um, a data management center. So you wouldn't expect much variation in the load. But if, it's a, if, they, if, it, was a, if it was a demand curve for a, perhaps a city, it would be significantly different. Okay, and then the other curve here is just to, to, just to show you there's lots of weekly variations. Most of the weekly variations, intermittent energies are for wind. Uh, you do have some variations for uh, solar, but not nearly as much as you do for wind. Okay, anybody understand why they call this the duck curve? <laughs> so. What we have here is this, uh, this is a duck curve, and what we're showing here on the sort of y-axis is the amount of energy that has to be dispersed from a power, a power company, a power source, to make up for the deficiency of intermittent energy like solar and wind, okay? And so what you see here on the left part of the curve by the tail of the duck, you see a certain amount of power has to be delivered by the power company to make up for the lack of uh, the uh, solar energy. But then as we get towards the middle of the day, these are, this is an hour of the day here and now, you see that drops down a little bit, okay? And that's because solar energy is starting to kick in. You don't need as much energy. And then it rises up again in the evening, okay, to form the head of the duck. Now with these various curves in the middle part of the duck, the belly of the duck is, the first two are show 2012 and 2013. These are, this is actual data, okay? And then the other curves are projected on what's going to happen as we start bringing in more of this intermittent energy into the system. There's two important things to, uh, about this curve was, was telling us that the utility companies are very concerned with. One is that uh, as the belly of the curve gets deeper here, you have a risk of more overgeneration capability. That, that means cost. That means you sometimes have to de-ramp energy. You have to dump it somehow. Uh, it's very inefficient. And the other in part is this uh, important part is this neck of the duck, which means that you have this ramping effect that you have to bring in all this power very quickly online to meet the demand as, it, as that demand increases over a very short period of time. Now, there's all sorts of ways of addressing that curve, right? You can look at it from uh, uh, you know, how, how do you have better air conditioning systems? Perhaps you have uh, an air conditioning system that pre, uh, produces chilled water when you don't need the, the, the amount of power as much, and so you can distribute it over long periods of time. Okay, so there's all sorts of ways of doing it. But energy storage is a significant way of addressing that uh, duck curve. So where are we now in, with energy storage? So these circles, represent, the size of circles represent how much proportionally uh, of different types of energy storage globally, okay? So you can see the biggest amount of energy storage we have right now is pumped hydro, okay? And then we have compressed air and all the way down to flow batteries. So you can see how small the, everything is other than pumped hydro. The problem is, is that 99% of the total capacity right now is pumped hydro, but there's very limited expectation to be able to grow pumped hydro in the future because it's geographically restricted and geo geologically restricted. Okay. So there is a huge market for energy storage other than pumped hydro. And, uh, um, the global market is increasing uh, significantly, and then for us in Ohio, it has more of a significant impact because we are a manufacturing 
state in a sense, and therefore uh, being part of the energy storage industry could be significant for the state of Ohio because it's not just making batteries and implementing batteries so we have more renewables, but it's also, you know, the materials industry in Ohio, the polymers, the metals, uh, the design and fabrication industries, uh, the integrators, the Eatons and Rockwells and those people put things together and then the, in, the uh, bring them into the utility. So it could have a significant impact on a lot of industry in Ohio. So everybody asks, well, what's wrong with the batteries we have now? Okay. Uh, we're all familiar with the various type of battery technologies you have now, lead acid, lithium ion, sodium sulfur. So they all have certain limitations, okay? Uh, different type of limitations. Some of them have high initial costs. Some of them have higher costs over the life cycle. For example, a lot of people put lead acid batteries into a local uh, solar facility that they have in their har farm or their home. And, uh, and what, it's very, relatively low cost, but it really irritates them and it only lasts about two or three years. So they have to replace it. So now we have cycle life problems there. Uh, and then the, some of these uh, systems are very toxic and corrosive. Um, and then some of them are very dangerous from fires. You know, everybody's heard about the lithium ion fire. Could you imagine having your laptop uh, battery scaled up so it's the size of this building and what could possibly happen there? Uh, and then uh, uh, there's many of these technologies are non-earth abundant materials, okay? So uh, the energy densities are, uh, most of them are pretty, you know, some of them are pretty good, some of them are not so good, but for large scale energy density, the energy density is not a significant factor, okay? It is for transportation, it's for your car, you have to have high energy density, but for a stationary application, you don't really need high energy density, as long as you don't make it too low energy density, that's too huge of a system. And by the way, the efficiencies of a reasonable energy storage system for any type of utility application is gonna to have to be about 70, 75%. You put, you put X amount of energy in there, you gotta get 75% of it back. Otherwise, no matter what you do, the economics are gonna kill you. Okay, so at Case, we've been working on a development of, a, uh, of an energy storage system based on iron. Uh, iron is the main chemical component of it. It, uh, it starts out with uh, two simple reactions. We start out with a, two containers, uh, the green container and the black container there, and they contain a solution of uh, iron chloride, okay, all in the iron two state. And in the center there is a, uh, these two, um, it's, it's actually the device itself, the battery device itself. Uh, it has um, uh, and a membrane with two electrodes in there. And basically what you're doing in this particular energy storage system is on the positive side, when you're putting electricity in, you're going from iron two to iron three, as shown in the first reaction. And I won't use too many reactions. I won't use too much. Uh, formulas <laughs> in here. Uh, on the other side, though, you're going from iron two to iron zero. Okay, so everything is just iron going from a two to a three straight state to, or to a zero state uh, when you're charging it up. And when you're just charging, you're just running the opposite. Okay, the particular innovation we have now is when you go to the iron zero state, you normally plate that iron out into that cell stack which limits how much iron you can actually have in a system, and limits how much energy you can store in that system, okay? And what we've been able to do is we've been able to create now a, part, um, uh, a tank on that left side that's shown as black, and you see the liquid slurry flowing out of there. That's a very fine carbon particle in water or electrolyte water slurry system. Okay, and now we're able to actually plate that iron onto these particles. So we can take those particles out of the reactor now, and so we can size the reactor. We can make it bigger, or we can make more cells in the stack, so we can build up the power. We can make it kilowatts, megawatts, uh, hundreds of megawatts, and then for the length of time for the energy, whether it's an hour or two hours, we can have bigger, bigger tanks. Okay, so we can decouple energy and power so we can design systems that are much lower cost. Okay, so what is lower cost? 
Okay, right now, our estimates are about $40 per kilowatt hour for a six hour system. Okay, $240 per kilowatt for, in terms of power. Okay, that compares to a DOE target of $100 per kilowatt hour, significantly less. Batteries right now, uh, for example, lithium batteries and that, they're on the order of 500 to maybe $1,500 per kilowatt hour. Okay, just to give you a comparison. So this is significantly reduction. But in addition to that, it's using sustainable materials, okay, uh, and it's a pH neutral chemistry. It's not strongly acidic. It's not strongly basic. Okay, so it's safe. It's easy to manufacture. It's safe to install and maintain. It just uses non-toxic water, salt, and iron solutions. Okay, so we think there's a lot of positive features in this system uh, that can be scalable for very large-scale energy storage. We're beyond the proof of concept. We've done all the experiments in the little laboratory cells. We've done the experiments in the whole cells, putting them together systems, you know, with small cells. We are now working on the big cells. And uh, so what we have right now is uh, uh, we have some core technology. We have a number of patents, and we have additional patents uh, pending uh, in, in, on this technology. Uh, we are now scaling up and demonstrating it on a much larger size. We have a licensee for the technology, one licensee, uh, which is trying to create now, or they're making a 48 volt, six kilowatt, six hour system that they plan to put into data centers as first trial. And then we've uh, just recently are receiving another ARPA-E grant. Uh, this work is supported by Department of Energy, Office of Electricity, and ARPA-E, and ARPA-E likes to to uh, the fund research that's transitioning into the commercial marketplace. And so we have a, uh, a grant from them to uh, create a, a 10 volt, one kilowatt system. And then uh, I put a, a truck up here uh, because everybody asked me how big is this gonna be? And uh, this, this uh, semi truck, we estimate we can put in about a 200 kilowatt, 1200 kilowatt hour system or six hour system running at 200 kilowatts. Uh, in a truck uh, tractor trailer. Uh, and it seems like it's in vogue these days for people developing large scale energy storage systems to do the demonstration in tractor trailers to show how many they can put into a different application. There's actually an article in the Plain Dealer about a lithium battery system in a tractor trailer this past weekend. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just want to summarize that uh, there is a large growing energy storage st uh, market for. Uh, for, for stationary storage. Uh, we have some uh, interesting technology. We think that it's low cost, efficient, it's scalable, long duration, and it has some interesting features of being safe and environmentally uh, nice. And the next steps are really to, to scale up into a much larger system to demonstrate, which is really out of the realm of the university. So we're walking, working uh, somewhat in the university, but we're also working with uh, industrial partners to do this. Thank you. You've been watching Bob Savinel talking about new types of large capacity batteries. Up next is Dr. Laura Kahn discussing the impact of large scale agriculture on antibiotic effectiveness. Now, back to the talk. I'm delighted to be here to talk with you about One Health and the politics of antimicrobial resistance. Briefly, the One Health concept is very simply that human, animal, and environmental health are linked. And because they are linked, complex subjects such as antimicrobial resistance must be addressed and examined in an interdisciplinary uh, approach. Um, the One Health Initiative website, the URL is up on the screen. Uh, my colleagues and I have been running it since 2008. It's a labor of love. Uh, it's been serving as a repository for all news and information pertaining to One Health. Please visit it. So what exactly is antimicrobial resistance? Well, you heard from the previous speaker about the resistance of the HIV virus. Um, in my talk, I'm going to strictly be talking about bacteria. Very briefly, what's the difference between a virus and a bacteria for those of you who are not scientists? Uh, a virus that you have on the left is technically not alive. 
It is, uh, does not eat, it doesn't drink, it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't do any of the things that something alive would do, and so theoretically you cannot kill it. V viruses are parasites, they invade cells, they turn those cells into machines to produce more viruses. In contrast, bacteria are complete living entities. They eat, they drink, they reproduce, they do uh, everything basically that we can do except drive a car. Um, antibiotics do not affect viruses. They affect, I mean, they, they affect bacteria. Some bacteria develop resistance to these antibiotics and they can share this resistance with other uh, bacteria. So in the research that I did over the past four and a half years looking at antimicrobial resistance, basically I was interested in the blame game that's been going on between medicine and public health on the one hand, veterinary medicine and agriculture on the other. Medicine blames agriculture for the excessive use of antibiotics in livestock, primarily the growth promoting antibiotics, and agriculture has been blaming medicine for the misuse. Now the reason why antibiotics are so important is because they form the foundation of modern medicine. Without effective, safe antibiotics, many of the things that we take for granted in modern medicine could not be done. Elective surgeries, chemotherapies, autoimmune treatments, many of these things would just be too risky to do because of the risk for infection. So for today, for the sake of time, I'm only going to touch upon uh, what I found in Denmark, European Union, the United States, looking strictly at antibiotic use and antimicrobial resistance, everything in black I do not cover today. A quick disclaimer that I am not the representative from any of the governments whose data I'm, I'm uh, showing to you, so whatever I did with, these, with the data uh, and whatever conclusions I make are from my own analysis and my work. So just to make that straight. Let's be clear that all uses of antibiotics lead to resistance. So in animals, they've been used for growth, prevention, and treatment. And in humans, they've used uh, for prevention and treatment. Quickly defining terms, when I talk about low dose, I'm also talking about subtherapeutic, non-therapeutic, and growth promoting. This is used in livestock. And by that, I mean levels as low as one part per million in feed, in contrast to 100 parts per million or more used to treat sick, sick animals. Uh, the major foodborne bacteria uh, that are of concern include Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, and Enterococcus faecium. In this talk today, I'm going to strictly talk about Enterococcus faecium, and that's because that virus, the rise of vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus faecium, is what drove policy in the European Union. And so I compare and contrast what happened in the European Union with what happened with, in the United States vis-a-vis -vis this particular bacteria. So the rise of VRE, or vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus, uh, the first case reports were in 1988 in European hospitals, and a few years later, VRE was found in food animals in England and Germany. Avoparsin, which is a growth-promoting antibiotic, similar to vancomycin in uh, chemical class, was used in Europe since the early 1970s and was assumed to be the cause of VRE in the hospitals. So just to uh, highlight again the relationship between avoparsin, which was the growth-promoting antibiotic in livestock, and vancomycin, which is one of the big gun antibiotics used in human medicine. It's one of the uh, drugs of last choice uh, against this uh, bacteria, Enterococcus faecium and Enterococcus faecalis. I'm only talking about faecium today. So in Denmark, the Danish scientists were very concerned about the emergence of VRE uh, and for the general use of antibiotics in livestock in general. Denmark relied heavily on avoparsin 
uh, and other growth promoting antibiotics. I should also uh, mention that the animals that are the largest recipients of these low dose growth promoting antibiotics are pigs and poultry, and primarily pigs. So in 1995, VRE was found in healthy chickens and pigs in Denmark. In response, the farmers voluntarily stopped using avoparsin, and in 1997, the EU banned avoparsin as well. In 1999, the Danish farmers stopped using all antibiotic growth promoting agents. Now this is an important slide and I want you to remember it. On the left, you see a nice 90% drop of VRE on the farms. This is a 90% drop in pigs and poultry on the farms after avoparsin use was stopped. Unfortunately, on the right, you see the rate of VRE in the hospitals. And uh, unfortunately, the rate seems to be going up. So 90% drop on the left. You see that nice decreased curve and uh, no 90% drop uh, in the hospitals. Now remember that. Now in the European Union in 2003, they decided to prohibit all antibiotics as growth promoting agents and the ban took effect in 2006. The EU established a number of surveillance systems uh, to assess antibiotic use and resistance. And unfortunately, in the case of VRE in livestock, the reporting was voluntary, and there was not enough data to analyze the effect of the avoparsin ban on VRE in livestock. Now, briefly talking about antibiotic use in humans in Europe, if you look on the left-hand left side of the uh, slide, you'll see cephalosporin use in 2011. Now, cephalosporin is a, uh, a type of uh, kind of a synthetic penicillin uh, derivative, and you can see that um, there's a great variation from uh, country to country. You have at the top of the slide very low judicious use of antibiotics in the Scandinavian countries and much higher use in the Mediterranean countries down at the bottom of the slide. Now on the right hand side is vancomycin use in the European country. What was unexpected during my research was that one, this data is not publicly available and two, I had to sign a whole bunch of forms for them to release it to me. Three, they did not give permission for me to uh, tell you which country is using how much vancomycin. Now, why the use of vancomycin is so political that I cannot show you the name of the country, I do not know. But nevertheless, remember that the use of vancomycin varies quite a bit from country to country. Now, remember that slide that I showed you from Denmark, the nice 90% drop of VRE on the farms? This is VRE data from hospitals across the EU. Uh, this is VRE bacteremia, meaning VRE in bloodstream infections. And if you look at the slide, the take home message here is that it's essentially a mess. There is no obvious trend. There is no nice 90% drop across all of the countries that one would expect from an avoparsin ban. So at the bottom of the slide, you see the Scandinavian countries start out with nice low rates of resistance, and they continue to have low rates of resistance throughout the years that I tracked. Uh, there are some countries that have rates that go up and down, some that go up, some that go down. The bottom line is there's no uh, obvious trend. Now, VRE in the United States is quite different. Uh, it emerged in the 1990s in the U.S., and interestingly, the U.S. never approved avoparsin, so the picture of VRE in this country is very different. Unfortunately, VRE is a huge problem in U.S. hospitals. 77% of uh, healthcare-associated efficium infections are, in fact, VRE. And the CDC estimates about 10,000 infections per year and about 650 deaths per year of VRE. So as I said, the U.S. never approved this growth-promoting agent. Uh, and uh, the bureaucratic leaders at the CDC, FDA, and the USDA 
brought together funds to uh, fund a surveillance system, the National Antimicrobial Resistance uh, Monitoring System, and the National Animal Health Monitoring System. So when looking at the data from those monitoring systems, this is the National uh, Antibiotic Resistance Monitoring System. And if you look at chickens, chicken meat, and pork chops uh, in VRE, the rate is zero, zero, zero all across the board. In other words, there was no VRE in these animals or in the chicken meat or pork chops. Now, unfortunately, NARMS does not collect efecium data on humans, so I don't have that data. But nevertheless, we know it's a big problem in the hospitals. Similarly, from the National Animal Health Monitoring System in pigs, VRE in pigs, zero in the years tested. So this is strong evidence that VRE did not come from the farm animals. Now, Americans use a lot of antibiotics, and they, in fact, used, uh, in the years that uh, VRE emerged, used far more vancomycin than in the EU. They used about two times more than France, and about 11 times more than the Netherlands. Now, up until around 2008, uh, what we have been doing, we've been tracking these resistance genes. And one way to think about it is you can think about these resistance genes as like genes for red hair. So we've been tracking people with red hair. And we've been putting people into a room people with red hair, and trying to figure out how they're related to each other based on their hair color. And you simply cannot do it. The only way that you can really tell the uh, uh, genetic relationship between these, uh, between these bacteria is to look at their genomic data. And uh, before 2008, the uh, cost of sequencing the genome of an organism was far too expensive. Once 2008 came, the price started to drop uh, tremendously to the level where researchers could start Im implementing it in their research. And in 2009, uh, research done on uh, the genomics of these organisms was done, and it found that there's about one or two clones that caused initial outbreaks, proliferating into multiple clones, becoming endemic in hospitals. What they found is that the hospital VRE is genetically different from the VRE that was found in livestock and in healthy people in the community. What they found was there's some, a couple studies done in Denmark found that their VRE precursor, or the genetic parent, if you will, came from an animal, but just not the livestock that everyone had assumed. And instead, the genomic evidence suggests that it might have been coming from a dog. Now, companion animals are completely ignored in the discussion about antibiotic resistance. And yet, these animals share our homes, share our food, sleep in our beds. Uh, they, you know, we spend considerable amount of time with them. And yet, they are not part of any surveillance system. So pets and... Uh, Pets get treated with antibiotics as well. So do the livestock. Um, the livestock get antibiotics to treat disease as well, uh, as I said, also for uh, the growth rates, which that use is now being curtailed. And so the CDC uh, put out a, a report back in 2013 estimating that over 2 million people fall ill with resistant infections. 23,000 die. Healthcare costs anywhere between 20 to 35 billion dollars per year. This is a serious problem. Now, I'm not going to make friends with the uh, healthcare researchers in this room, but I'm just uh, comparing the cost that we spend, or the uh, the amount of money that we spend between human healthcare research and animal healthcare research. So the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is the NIH equivalent for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in 2016 received about $4 million in funding. For 2017, it's been allocated to receive zero. 
Now, I would argue to you that some of the greatest discoveries in the history of medicine and public health were made at the intersection between human and animal health. And by spending zero dollars on animal health research, we're not, uh, we're not uh, I think that's insufficient for making important discoveries. Um, oh, I'm run out, run out of time, okay. So uh, I'm not gonna have time to talk about bacteriophages as one alternative uh, antibiotic treatment. But anyway, in conclusion, there is no evidence that the uh, EU avoparsin ban in 2006 decreased VRE in the hospitals. VRE is a serious problem in the US, and there's no evidence that it came from the livestock. Resistance surveillance must include genomic data and companion animals, because only then can you tell where these microbes are coming from. Antibiotic use varies widely between states and countries with large variations, and it's unclear why this is so, very likely cultural practices. Uh, and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture uh, receives insufficient funding, in my opinion, to make any progress on this critical issue. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, I've run out of time, so I think I'll probably have to take questions um, afterwards. Thank you. The Real Science Now lectures are hosted by the Great Lakes Science Center and presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University, its College of Arts and Sciences, and MediaVision. For more information on Real Science Now and the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.